So welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar Series. Today, uh, my name is Chen Lu, and I'm a social professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Today, we have uh, our guest, <laughs> not guest, I'm our speaker, Dr. Yu Zhang from our department. So Dr. Yu Zhang is a professor in our department, Civil and Environmental Engineering, and uh, she's currently the director of the National Institute of Congestion Reduction, uh, which is a national university uh, Transportation Center, uh, sponsored by USDOT, and uh, Dr. Zhang is also an associate director of the uh, USDOT Tier One uh, UTC for transportation, environment, and uh, community health. And uh, Dr. Zhang's uh, recent research mainly involves the mathematical and uh, mathematical programming and algorithm development, simulation tools, and uh, Statistical and econometric modeling and um, deep learning, machine learning for solutions for more efficient, sustainable, and uh, resilient multimodal transporting systems. She also serves as the um, the chair for the standing committee of the TRB Transporting Research Board for the um, airfield and uh, airspace uh, performance. She's also the associate associate editor for the Journal of Transporting Research, Part D, uh, on transport, transport and uh, environment. And she also served, uh, served on a couple of uh, editorial board of, of some journals. Okay, And uh, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Zhang. Thank you so much, Dr. Introduction. All right, um, thank you all for being here, either in the classroom or online. So today I want to take this opportunity um, to showcase the research in the advanced air mobility or called urban air mobility field at USF. And that is mainly done through um, the Smart Urban Mobility Laboratory with the postdoc, um, PhD student, and a master student in my group. So here's a, just a brief kind of <clears throat> excuse me introduction of our lab. So currently we focus on several areas. One is advanced air mobility, which I will um, uh, introduce today. We also have done quite a lot of work in the shared micro mobility, rider sourcing, and the shared autonomous vehicles. And I have been trained to uh, apply operations research in air traffic management. So we continue working in this field, um, collaborating with the FAA, like a next gen office, next generation air transportation system office. And we also um, um, working in the transition resiliency. And the mainly uh, the study was sponsored by National Science Foundation. And now we also look into transition electrification and equity. About uh, one year ago, we finished the one project sponsored by Transition Research Board through the IDEA Transit Program, and that is looking into the multi-stage, multi-format uh, charging design for the transit electrification. All right, so what is advanced air mobility? Um, I think that is not a really brand new idea because we have seen that for a long time we have used the helicopter to transport the passengers and the goods in our city area, right? However, in 2017, given the breakthrough of the technologies, especially information technology and also the uh, flying vehicle manufacturing technology, NASA start to talk about urban air mobility again. And back at the time, they focused on the transition from the traditional management of air transportation operation to the future passenger or cargo carrying air transportation services within the urban environment. And after that, about one and a half years later, um, the community actually expands the terminology from urban air mobility to advanced air mobility because we have underutilized airspace not only just in the urban area but also in the rural area in the large metropolitan region and by utilizing that we actually could provide the services to those areas that currently not uh, served by the air transportation and that will improve the efficient movement of the passengers and the goods um, now 
in 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 our lab at USF, we focus on more kind of high density and the more challenging problems of the advanced air mobility in the urban environment. So that's why you probably will hear me talk a lot about urban air mobility. And but it's part of the advanced air mobility and focusing on more challenging problems in the high density uh, urban environment. <clears throat> So NASA has done a lot of work, you know, try to pave kind of the roadmap um, to the future uh, advanced air mobility. So there's a one figure in the document shows the different maturity levels of the urban air mobility. It's really hard to read, so I put them into different slides. Then you can look at the main components of the different maturity levels of urban air mobility. So the first stage focused on the uh, aircraft certification and also the community demonstration data collection. And for the second one, it's a low density and the mainly we use the existing infrastructure. For example, we have general aviation airports unutilized. We have the helipads that could be converted to the water ports for the, um, the UAM. So, and also um, the second stage will include the initial part 135 operation approvals. And if somebody is familiar with this field and tracing the news, uh, know that uh, the Joby Aviation actually uh, got the Part 135 operation approval. It does not mean the, the, the vehicles that they are manufacturing got the certification. It means that the Joby Aviation, they obtained um, the certification to fly the piloted aircraft as a company. Okay. Um, and then there's a uh, level three, level four. So level three is still low density and the operations could include the urban core and it looks into the noise compatibility with urban uh, soundscape. And then the level four actually goes to another level. It goes from the low density to the medium density. And it talks about you know, hundreds, hundreds of sim simultaneous operations and it shows the network would expand it. And then there are the feder uh, federated ATM service through the um, provider of services for urban air mobility, which called PSU. So before that, you know, maybe it could be rely on the self separation of the operators, but once we get the medium uh, density, we need the PSU service. And then five and six are the maturity levels with more and uh, simultaneous operations, and it will be more complicated, and also it will involve higher uh, requirement about the noise compatibility of the flying vehicles. So I'll just uh, sh share with everybody, you know, what could be the future on demand urban air mobility? And it's pretty similar as what we are using Uber or Lyft right now. But you will see there are a lot of the complexity involved in providing this on-demand urban air mobility. So the aircraft will have pre-departure planned trajectory to follow to avoid obstacles in the airspace. And there's a conflict detection and also the conflict resolution.
Does incorporative objects appear and the UAM vehicles need to be able to detect that and avoid it? And there's the cybersecurity involved. And then they get to the word report and they need to detect the objects on the ground. Once it's safe to land, they could land on the word report and the passengers could leave and get to the final destination either by walking or other ground transportation. So this is very much similar as the, you know, maybe the shared mobility that we are currently using right now, like Uber Lyft. The difference is that there's a vertical, the ground infrastructure involved, and also using airspace. And in the airspace, there'll be, you know, pre-departure flight planning. There'll be a uh, real-time uh, con conflict uh, detection, resolution, and etc. So sorry. And to achieve that, we have a long way to go. And NASA actually identified, you know, the challenges in five different areas, including airspace system design and implementation, the airspace fleet operations management, aircraft development production, individual aircraft management operations, and also very, very important is a community integration, because this is a different uh, future urban air mobility is different from the commercial aviation that we are having right now, where the commercial air airport is a little bit far away from the city um, and they're taken care of by the aviation authority, right, or airport authority. But for the future advanced air mobility, the vertiport will be located very close to the community. So there will be uh, involvement of the uh, federal, state level, and also the local stakeholders. And the community integration is very important. And it will include the public awareness, public acceptance, and also the integration of the urban air mobility with the existing multimodal transportation system. All right, so the NASA urban air mobility, they actually have a count up document uh, focused on the maturity level four and above. And then in the different areas that we showed in previous figure, actually it shows what are the unknown areas and what are the barriers and what are the unknown areas. And um, for example, for the aerodrome design, uh, there's a, a no areas aerodrome design standards. And for this one, FAA actually uh, generated this draft guidance for the vertical design, and then uh, it's open to the public's comments. And we see that this document actually is pretty preliminary because there are a lot of the different um, challenges and uh, 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 challenges have not been considered why they put together this. So, but we believe that with all the comments from the aviation community, this guideline will be refined and it will have more um, well set up uh, standards to guide the future development of the board ports. I'll just quick, quickly go through this. So they involved like the different shape different shapes could it be square could it be round and what the signage could be used for the vertical ports and also there's uh, the airspace clearance next to uh, the potential vertical ports then also there's a protective uh, areas and together with this um, with this uh, taxiways that um, if if there will be a vertical port on the airport then there's a certain required minimum distance from the vertical port to the taxiway and also to the runway. So for those who are interested in, you can go to the FAA website in the, uh, um, you can find this guideline. And uh, I think the comment uh, period may have been, may have ended, but still, if you have any comments, you can contact the airport office directly. Now for our lab, we actually focus on several of the research and meet the unknown areas. For example, for the airspace fleet operations and the management, we actually look at the pre-departure flight planning and uh, try to achieve the zero airspeed collision. And then we also um, select the high density routes uh, with the automated algorithm. 
we also do uh, make sure that our algorithm actually could be used for scalable um, operations. Another thing is that location of extension into the ATC control airspace. We have a research that will demonstrate that. And in terms of fleet management, we also are is, we're developing a tool that can evaluate the impact to the community from the mobility perspective, from the environmental perspective, and also the equity perspective. And our methods from the scalable airspace operations actually could be used by PSU. So PSU is a, um, a provider of the provider of the service to urban air mobility. And we do not do any specific research in the area of individual aircraft management and operations, but I listed here for those who are interested in, you can look into the unknown area. Maybe you can get some research ideas from these unknown areas. And similar as the aircraft development and production. But we do work on some of the topics in the community integration. So, you know, our study, including our outreach effort, will help the public to get familiar with the UAM. And also, uh, we look into the energy infrastructure requirement because we're talking about for the urban air mobility, we will use electric vertical and takeoff landing vehicles. And that is how the future urban air mobility would be accepted by the general public because the electric, electric uh, what called the EV tour, is much quieter than the helicopters that we're using right now for the urban air mobility. And also we work a lot on the multimodal integration, which you will see later. And we also um, participate in discussing about the role of the local government and learning some um, based on some lessons that we learned from the shared mobility. So this is the tool that we are developing at USF. I call it um, design and evaluation for the shared air mobility, which is called the SAMDE. And this model, acts, this tool, including uh, quite a lot of modules, and the different modules can answer certain questions that I mentioned earlier, but when we put them together, module one, two, three actually will connect with the regional demand modeling and reach to the new equilibrium for the regional transition system when we introduce the future urban air mobility. And then for M5, M6, actually we develop a simulation tool to simulate the on-demand urban air mobility. So we can look into the operations of the future UAM system. And then we have the evaluation tool. We look into the regional mobility impact analysis, energy and environmental impact analysis, and also the equity impact analysis. And on the right, it lists the outputs from different module and from this tool. So we can do the vertical, optimal vertical location. We can do uh, the traffic demand estimation and we can do uh, the pre-departure conflict-free trajectory design, et cetera, et cetera. So now let's get into the different modules and give you a little bit more information. So the first study in my group was integrated network design and a demand estimation for on-demand UAM. And that is the collaborative work between uh, my PhD student, Ji Chang Wu, or called Adam, and, and myself. And it has been published on the Elsevier Journal Engineering, and that is a public accessible through this uh, link. So we actually conducted a literature review and I found out that you know in the existing literature, when people look into the vertical location, they either from the demand side or from the supply side, or very few of them look into the both, but they assumed that the demand is given. However, we know that the location of the vertipods actually affect how many people considering switch from ground transportation to the air, right? And vice versa, when more people considering you know, switch from ground to air, you may want to put a vertiport there. So there's a connection between the, the siding, uh, the locations of vertiports, and also uh, the mode of choice of the potential passengers. So our study is to create integrated modeling to take the both sides into, into one model. So first thing what we did is we identified the candidate vertical locations by looking, using the LIDAR data 
to create the 3D map of the region that we're interested in studying. Yes, so what is the multiple sighting problem? If we look at this figure, we do have a region and destination indicated with different colors, right? And what we can do is from the previous step, we actually can find the candidates locations. So those candidate locations will be dependent on land use types, dependent on zoning uh, code, and also dependent on if there's enough space to put the voting ports. So there are many factors to in involved in determining if it's a candidate or not. And once we have these candidates, then we can apply a model, which I will show later, then to to, to find out um, the optimal word ports. Like in this case, we could find, you know, four optimal word ports, and then the passengers uh, from the origin actually will access those word ports with the ground time station. And then there's an air route to connect to each of the word ports. And then once they get there, they will take the ground transition again, either walking or other modes, get to their final destination. And for all other trips, uh, it does not make sense for them to switch from ground time station to the urban mobility. So they will keep on using the ground time station. So the vertical siding problem is how given, given the demand and the, given the candidate word ports, how can we find the optimal locations of the word ports? If we look at that network, it's it has a similarity with the hub and spoke network for air transportation, right? However, in the air transportation, uh, one thing is the demand is given, and there's no change according to where the hub is located, and also uh, most of the time that hub and spoke network is for individual airline, and also only consider the single transportation mode. Another thing is in the uh, hub and spoke network problem, or sometimes we call the P-median problem, they usually consider the travel time, but not involve both the um, trade-off between the travel time and the travel cost. So that's why we proposed this extended single allocation hub and spoke problem. So in our case, uh, we introduced the different decision variables. Um, so Y equal to one, when it is selected as a word report. And then um, the ZP here, if it's one, then the trip P will go through the pure ground transition and the zero otherwise. And then we'll also have, you know, look into the access mode and the egress mode of the potential UAM operations. So we look into the system generalized cost. So basically, given the trips in one region, we want to look at how to minimize the entire system generalized cost. And then we inherited some constraints from the standard hub and spoke modeling structure. Besides that, we were also we also included the word port access and egress mode related constraints to determine the choices from passengers. And also there's another additional constraint to um, show how the potential passengers will make the travel mode choice. So this formula basically tell us is that the, it's a logic of mode choice means the users will switch to the UM service if the value of save the travel time is more than the additional cost that they have to pay for using the urban air mobility service, right? Logically, it's acceptable, but of course there's a variation because we, you know, passengers are not uh, homogeneous. There's a heterogeneity. But it's OK for now, just as a simplified, uh, um, reasonably simplified uh, constraint. And then in our case study, for example, this uh, Tampa Bay area is our case study. So far, we obtained the simulated individual trips from the TBRPM, the regional model. And then for each of the trip, actually given the uh, salary level in this region, we simulated and obtain randomly get uh, the salary level of the travelers. And then from there, we can calculate the value of time of those travelers and then use that in our model. Now, of course, in our model, we also have some other parameters, right? So if you're interested in the details, you can go to uh, engineer 
Engineering Journal, and you can read the paper. There are a lot of the details there. So for this case study, we found out that for 266 uh, thousand trips, which is those trips are either longer than 10 miles or their travel time is more than 30 minutes, then about 0.2% of that will switch from ground transportation to uh, the multimodal urban air mobility. And among the 100 candidate word reports, we actually chosen 30 of them. And this table on the left shows the number of trips served by each of the word reports. So it's not evenly disputed. Some of the word reports actually serve more passengers and some of them serve fewer passengers. So the outcome of this research is we can obtain the optimal locations of word reports and meanwhile, we can find out the passenger demand that diverted from the ground transition to the urban air mobility. And we also can find out which urban air mobility which two urban uh, vertical ports actually they will go through, each passenger will go through, and also what kind of access and egress modes they're going to take. Now, from there, we can calculate do the post analysis and then find out how much time could be saved and what is the reduced system generalized cost. We also, in, in our study, we also did the sensitivity analysis. So we varied the number of the vertical ports from 30 to 40, 50, et cetera, et cetera. And also we look into the different pricing schemes of the future urban air mobility. And also what is the impact of the intermodal efficiency? That means from ground transportation to air transportation, there's a transport time, right? If the intermodal efficiency is high, the transport time will be low and vice versa. So that transfer time, when we look into the impact uh, in the total travel time, it actually would affect the results. So we did all these sensitive analysis, and it gave us pretty good uh, use, useful insights. Yeah. What? There's no sound. How about now? Uh, I can hear you, Dr. Zhang. I hear you. Can, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yes. there was no problem. Okay, for those, if you cannot hear me, probably you can um, leave the meeting and then get in again. And also, if you cannot do it, try to use the browser instead of using uh, the Microsoft Team app. All right, so I think I need to speed up because... <laughs> Um, another study that we have done is automated flight planning of high density urban mobility operations. And this is a collaborative research between my uh, PhD student Hua Long and also uh, another student, Vahid, and also Dr. Chakat from the Industry and Management uh, System Engineering. And we also uh, received an award from Amazon Research Award, and we uh, present we will present this in the AI Aviation Forum this year. So the research uh, objective is we, we want to provide a pre-departure flight planning service and we look into uh, the medium to high density and then make sure there's a zero conflict operations. And our objective is to try to minimize operating cost. So to answer this question, actually there are two critical questions. One is how should the airspace be structured for the urban air mobility? Another one is how could the conflicts be resolved at the pre-departure planning stage? And from our literature, we found out um, um, instead of having very well-structured airspace that used by currently commercial aviation, um, the layer layer structure, the layer structure with the uh, free flight at each layer could be most efficient for future urban air mobility in terms of the uh, safety and efficiency. So that's how we did. And in this tool, uh, we call it automated uh, UAM flight planning system. We actually developed the two module. One is the low attitude airspace management system. Um, we create the route network. And the other one is we detect the conflict and uh, resolve the conflict, which is called low attitude traffic management system. And um, 
So for the first model, we first need to create the UAM environment. And we also get the LiDAR data and the create a 3D map. And from the 3D map, uh, we also use the uh, clustering, came in clustering to find the uh, unflyable, unflyable obstacles at each flight level. And then we create this UAM operation environment. With that, we also use the visibility graph, try to find out the possible routes at each of the level. So if you look at the first figure on the left, um, we have the buildings or obstacles and with each of them with different height, right? If you look at a region destination, we need to have an EV tall a climb from a region and go to destination. And there's obstacle in the middle. So dependent on how high that uh, EV tall will climb, either it has to go around the obstacle in the middle, or if it climb high enough, it can do, go directly to the destination. So that means dependent on which level this EV tall climb, there's a different routes, possible routes. And among those possible routes at that level, we actually can find one shortest path, right? So that means dependent on which level that uh, EV tower will climb, on each level, there's a one shortest path to get to the destination. So that is shown um, in the figure on the right. And then we actually uh, put all those information in our database. And we know that given different origin destination, if we assume there's a 3D routes in the air, it's a potentially, if we do not consider the temporal dimension, then it's possibly there's uh, intersections um, between these routes, right? So we collect all this information and store them in the database. And after that, given the flight operations, which is origin, destination, and departure time, now we add the fourth dimension, which is the time. Once we add that information and together with the database for the routes and intersection information from the previous tool, we can detect the potential conflicts. If it's yes, then we have the conflict resolution method to resolve that. If no, we're lucky and we get the conflict-free trajectories. So um, this paper has been published in Transition Research Part C, which is uh, Transportation Part Emerging Technologies. So if you're interested, you can go there and take a look at the, uh, the programming and also how we solve the problem. So here it just shows the aerial photo, uh, animate the solutions. So this is a 2D and actually they, the, each of the operations are assigned at a different flight level. So there's no conflicts at all for these thousands of operations in the region. And this pre-departure uh, flight planning could work for one operator, could also be used for multiple operators from by used by the PSU. And when we look into the multiple operators, we also applied a multiplication method, which called Nash Social Welfare, program and that purpose is to ensure the operators will not be treated unfairly if one of them has much fewer operation versus another one dominate the market okay so we use the national social welfare program to ensure that all right so outcomes of this research is we got a pre-departure conflict free trajectory for high density urban air mobility operations and the strategies to resolve the conflicts involve the flight level assignment, assign them on different flight level, also displace the departure time, let them delay a little bit to avoid the conflict. Another one is if we still cannot, um, still cannot get rid of all the potential conflict, then we will do the local speed control, okay? And then another thing I mentioned, we ensure the fairness among the different operators. It doesn't matter what their market share is. Doesn't matter if some of them, you know, have operations within very short distance and others are having long distance, or if some of them only operate in certain time period. So we make sure that everybody are treated equally. 
All right, so another study I want to share with you is to find the flying trajectory if the vertiports are either on or very close to the commercial airport. So the motivation, why, what is the motivation? Some of the potential operator, for example, Archer. Archer is a company and they are actually working with the large uh, hotel chains. So what they want to do is when the, the passengers or travelers land at the commercial airport, they will provide the service to transport them from the airport to the bigger hotel, like a Westin, Hyatt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one possible entry point for the uh, market is that connecting the trips between, you know, the place of the hotel and airport. But we know the airport environment is very complicated, right? We cannot, the urban mobility cannot interfere the existing commercial flight and also has to ensure the safety of the existing uh, commercial flights as well as the urban air mobility. So objective of this research is we want to propose a design approach to develop and integrate this uh, vertical takeoff landing trajectories in the non-segregated uh, airspace. So how do we do that is we mainly use the simulation and also we do the learning algorithm to find out the feasible uh, procedure. So first, the methodology, the first step is we, for the case study, we choose the vertical location based on the area uh, features. And by the way, this is a study actually collaborated with another master student called Rosia Fragile Villar. Uh, and now she actually started her own company, not specifically on this topic, but more on like applications of uh, amend aerial uh, vehicles. All right, so the first step is look into local terrain, area buildings and airport features, and try to figure out you know, the possible vertical locations. And then second is that we used the, the uh, um, called the Simode Pro. Simode Pro is a simulation tool developed by ATAC, sponsored by FAA. And from there, we, we first got the historical PDAS trajectory and then we simulate that in um, for the TPA airport. Then the third one is we look into the route design. First thing is looking into the mission profile. So back at that time, that was uh, in 2019, we actually used the Uber Elevate to propose the mission profiles. Now, mm. you probably know that Uber Elevate now has been bought by the Juby Aviation. All the people who worked for the Uber Elevate moved to Juby Aviation. And also from then to now, there are more, much more uh, manufacturers are uh, started um, manufacturing those EV tools. So this mission profile could be quite different now. Mm. Then uh, how we find out the, the, the feasible procedures for the EV tool operation is we use the uh, random tree algorithm. So from here, I will not go into the details. So basically we can apply that algorithm and then try to figure out what is the feasible uh, procedure. And here shows the 2D depiction. So it's every photo shows that this is could be the vertiport. And then these are uh, the possible routes for them to get out or get into the airport. Now our case study is the Tampa International Airport. So we chose three possible vertical locations. One is on the rooftop of the rental parking garage. Another one is on the rooftop of the main terminal area. And the vertical three actually is the helip helipad. I think it's on the stadium, Raymond Stadium, about two miles away from the airport. And mm -hmm. then, you know, after we apply the research methodology, actually we can find out the feasible procedures indicates the with purple color and the green color for getting in and get out of the airport. And the major finding of this research is that um, we found out yes. that for the two vertiports ports located inside the airport, when the required distance from manned traffic is more than 100 feet, the algorithm cannot find out the feasible solutions. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, so that means there's no permanently available. If we're given the, uh, the operations of the commercial flights, we cannot find the procedures that would work for the word uh, EV tour through entire of the day. Um, 
but you know this is just for Tampa International Airport. For other airports, dependent on their commercial uh, aviation operations patterns, as well as where the potential reports could be, the results would be different. So then it tells us that the methodology actually could still work, but we need to find the dynamically change procedures for the EV operations during the day. We probably can look into from hour to hour and then to see if we can possibly find uh, the, the, the uh, procedures. And this methodology certainly can be applied to other airports or areas and to evaluate the integration of the EV tour to the commercial airport. So the next study that we have done is we developed the simulation platform for the EV tour operations. So on the left is an illustration of the um, UAM uh, network. So the square shows the vertical ports and the, the yellow one shows the origin destination. And then here also shows a sketch of vertical ports. So there could be takeoff landing pad, which is relatively larger, and there could be the staging pad with the charging capability and which is smaller. And of course, in between, it could be connected with some uh, taxiways and there's a terminal building where people can wait for the services. And we also simulate the passenger arrivals to the vertical port and set up some rules to assign the passengers to EV tolls. So in our simulation, we basically simulate three types of objects. One is the passenger. So the passenger inputs include the origin destination and also the departure time. And then we also um, simulate the EV tour, each of the EV tours, their status, and the input would be initial location. For example, how we assign them at the beginning of the day at each of the EV tour uh, vertical ports, and what is the passenger capacity, and then EV tour features of that particular vehicle. And we also uh, simulate the objects of the vertical ports, origin destination vertical ports, and um, the input or the parameters could be the number of takeoff landing pads and the staging charging pads. And then from this simulation, we can get outputs related to different objects. For example, for the passengers, after simulation, we can know what is their travel time. That travel time will include from origin to destination, you know, including ground time station as well as the uh, the air route, and also the waiting time. Right, there's a certain rules of, of assigning them to the EV tour, so we can know how much they have to wait before they actually can get on the EV tour and get to the destination. And for the EV tour, we can find out their state of charge, their seat occupation, and also the utilization rate. So the seat of occupation is because we want to reach certain level of service. We will not let the EV tour wait until all the seats be filled, right? So depending on how the passengers will arrive, sometimes they may leave with one or two seats uh, empty. And then for the vertical ports, the output will be the facility occupancy, uh, occupancy and also the charging capacity. So which means at each of the vertical ports in one day, how much electricity will be charged for the EV tours? So those are you know, the outputs from the different objects. And actually this one, we are in the process to make it open source. And once it's uh, open source, then everybody can build up your own network with how many vertical ports you want and with the different kind of passenger arrival distributions and with the different OD matrix. And also you can um, assume, or based on what you can find, you can assume different uh, EV tour features. Because as I mentioned, there are more than 50 uh, companies actually working on manufacturing the EV tour. So their features could be different. And then with that tour, you can input all these uh, variables and then simulate it and obtain those different outputs. Okay, so I think I have a couple, not a couple of slides, but a couple of research. I'll go quickly. Another one that we done is to evaluate the environmental impact of the on-demand UAM. It actually extended from the previous integrated network and estimate, demand estimation study. And this is a collaborative work between um, another student, Pan Li Zhao and Joe Post, our uh, research 
uh, professor here and also another professor back in China. So we actually obtained the um, the output from the previous study, and then we look into the energy consumption rate, emission rate, and we look into uh, the difference between using the pure ground transmission versus using the multimodal transmission, how the greenhouse gas emission and the other air pollutant emissions will be different. OK, and then we also do the sensitive analysis. Why I put into two, two uh, categories. One sensitive analysis is we only need to change some of the parameters. But another sensitive analysis, when we look into different price scheme, the number of vertiports, we have to rerun the integrated network and demand estimation model again, and to obtain the direct travel demand and the trip information to do the comparison of the emissions. OK, so. Now the next table shows that for the case study of Tampa Bay region, uh, when we look into the pure ground transportation, which is the first row and the multimodal transportation, including the EV tall parts, excess and egress parts and total, we found out, you know, given that the EV tall is very energy incentive, uh, intensive, we actually cannot see the saving of or reduction of the air pollutant emission, but actually the opposite. So by saying this is, um, because the EV tall, although it does not emit any air pollution during the operation, but the electricity that EV tall is using coming from different resource mixes, it could be renewable energy like a solar, wind, etc. It could have come from the non-renewable energy like a coal or others, right? Now, for some of the trips, when it has significant travel time reduction between using the ground transportation and the urban air mobility, certainly there's a huge environmental benefits. And the benefit or the opposite actually dependent on what is the uh, energy resource mixes for electricity production. So our Florida area is actually kind of in the middle towards, you know, more non-renewable energy and the New York area is better than us, which means they use more renewable resources to produce the, the energy. So if the same on-demand urban air mobility is implemented in New York, they can gain better uh, environmental impact or, you know, uh, less air, additional air pollutant emissions. All right, so the ongoing efforts from my uh, research group is looking into uh, understanding the induced demand. So uh, we just finished a report where we use the online resources like a Twitter, YouTube comments related to the urban air mobility, and then try to understand if there will be induced demand after introducing the urban air mobility, and also what is the willingness to pay from the potential users. And we plan to do some simulation optimization for the fleet planning using the simulation tool and also looking into the equity issues to see if a future of ability actually will create opportunities to um, alleviate the transition inequality, historically inequality already there. And also we look into the regional mobility, environmental and equity impact, and we are working with FDOT on that. And uh, another one is the prestigious design on and near commercial airports. We have shown we need to do it dynamically, but not a permanent procedure given the existing commercial aviation operations. I think that's all for today, but there's a cartoon and I want to share with everybody called Jetson. And this is a more advanced concept back in 1960 because they look into the modular UAM already. That's very convenient, right? <laughs> Thanks, 
that will be far future of our life. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the attention. I welcome any questions, comments. Thank you. Yes. So, um, oh, we have a, a speaker. Yeah, Can you pass there. So um, thank you so much for the great presentation. A lot of work uh, in less than an hour to present it. So um, my question is more of uh, the idea of uh, uh, UAM in general. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like it requires a lot of skills, both from like consumers and probably uh, operators or like uh, manufacturing. Um, how autonomous this could be, like fully 100% autonomous in, in all aspects of the, the idea? That's a very good question, because for now, if it's a piloted, it, we may not have a um, financially feasible use case because the cost is pretty high when you just transport like a four or six passengers on, on the airplane, right? So the autonomous definitely would be the solution. And there, the companies actually are working um, along different directions. For example, when you look in Juby Aviation, Lilium, they first look at the piloted uh, flying vehicles and then consider how to transfer that to the totally autonomous, right? But the WISC, which is another company supported by Boeing and another foundation, they target on getting to the autonomous, you know, without putting pilots in the cockpit. So, I mean, the autonomous definitely is a, is a, is a solution to make it scalable, make it um, financially um, feasible, um, but it will take a pretty long time. And also the FA, the certification process, will be um, a challenge, you know. So, yeah, let's see. But um, we have seen, for example, on the ground transportation, we have seen the progress gradually, right? And now, actually, the Waymo has a, has a, a, a autonomous vehicle fleet on the ground. So hope that, you know, that success for experience could be transferred to the urban mobility. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking, actually, since it's been started with the ground transportation, we could this transform it to a quicker process for when it turns to uh, air mobility? Right, but for aviation, um, the safety requirement is more restrict because if you have mid-air collision, then um, the survive, you know, the, the possibility of survive from the mid-air collision is much lower than having a crash on the highway, right? So that's why aviation community and also the government agencies are very cautious about certify any of the flying vehicles. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the questions. I have a question. What's the time timeline of this coming to Tampa? Do you think 10, 20, 30 years? Hopefully not 30 years. Uh, in Tampa, one company based in Europe, Lilium, actually is you know, trying to promote a regional network in Florida. So they are considering, um, for example, Tampa, Miami, Orlando, Jacksonville, et cetera, et cetera, will set up the vertiports either using the existing general aviation airport or build like a new vertiport. For example, they are working with the Lake Luna in Orlando area to build up a vertiport so then they can have this regional uh, regional uh, network. And I think the regional air mobility could be the first step because one thing is that, you know, we have the infrastructure available and also they can follow the general aviation flight routes. And another thing is that it's possibly feasible for them to compete the existing commercial flights connect the different cities in Florida because the existing commercial flights is very low frequency. When you look at Tampa to Miami, we probably only have several flights in the day and the times are not so good, right? And also it's pretty expensive. So if Lilium or other operators could provide, you know, the air connections between these two cities, like maybe uh, 
depart like uh, every hour also, it will become very attractive. And so, so uh, in summary, I think it will not be 30 years because if they're using piloted aircraft and if they get the part 135 operation certification from FAA, they could have launched the service pretty soon. Um, so from my point of view, I'd probably be more optimistic is I think in three to five years, we may see that. Five years, I would say. But of course, for the on-demand services that I showed in the video, it will take much longer. Yeah. So from mature, maturity level one to maturity six, it will take time. Any other questions? Ah. So yeah, I understand where the comment coming from. So you're talking about if we use uh, the General Aviation Airport um, as a vertical port, then how that will be integrated into the existing services, right? Yeah, we can possibly do a simulation and also use the um, the learning algorithm to find out the possible procedures for the EV tours at the POK. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you.